it's been a while since I've done a video and I thought coming up to Christmas in cold weather and sometimes damp weather it might be an idea to talk about sellers because one of the things that we get lots and lots of inquiries about is people who say we've got a damp basement or a damp cellar and we don't know what to do with it and one of the things that always comes up is that people are told that they have to tank the cellar in order to make it dry and live in it. Well, not a good idea. Why is it not a good idea to tank a cellar? Tanking is something you do to a structure to effectively waterproof it. Now, if you think of a cellar as a hole in the ground, it's a, it's a trench, or if you like, a swimming pool. Now they make swimming pools out of cement, and that's what tanking does. It turns your cellar into a swimming pool. Now, okay, if you don't put water in the swimming pool, the theory is that the cellar stays dry, because it is actually tanked, it's turned into a giant tank. There's only one problem with that. And that is that the structure of the cellar outside of the tanking, in other words the walls of the cellar, are then able to get very very wet. So what you end up with is water all around the walls of your cellar. And you've not yet thought about the floor. You've tanked the walls. You might well have put something on the floor, but of course what you're doing then is you are filling the surrounding building fabric around the, 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 the cellar, the walls, the floor, everything, with water. And that then starts to deteriorate the building fabric. So if you've got old sandstone, for instance, or limestone, um, and you chuck a load of water into that, it will slowly start to dissolve the stone. And the most easily dissolved part of it is the mortar and quite often we go down and do surveys in cellars and basements and we see that the um, the mortar joints and everything that glues everything together has been heavily eroded away by by water because people have been tanking the system okay so what else is going to happen well of course you're going to get water evaporating out of those walls and the water will gradually, this is where rising damp comes in, because water will naturally evaporate. And as water becomes a gas, it rises. It's a very light gas. And I'll do another little video while we've got the camera set up, and I'll talk about the relationship between water as a gas and water as a liquid and, and dew points and all the rest of it. But I think at the moment we're looking at the cellar and we're saying, OK, there's moisture in these walls and it's going to go upwards. So where does it end up? It ends up in the walls above the cellar or above the basement. And you can just as equally look at this as being the subfloor of a Victorian semi, where you've got a, a timber floor and you've got a bit of an airspace below the, the timber floor and that airspace is supposedly being ventilated. And of course, if you block the vents by building the soil up, you then get a very stuffy, damp environment under the timber floor, which is why your timber floor rots. And I'm actually sitting in my, my study at the moment, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick the camera up in a second, and we're, we're going to take you around this and show you some of the things that happen if you get a wet cellar. Now then, we have a wet cellar, we have a damp cellar, and what we're going to do is have a look at how we make that cellar dry without tanking it. And it all comes down to ventilation. And when we do building surveys, I would say probably 95%, almost 100% of the cellars and the basements and the subfloor areas that we look at are badly ventilated. Now, if you let those areas get a little bit damp 
and it's damp because moisture is constantly working its way out, it's diffusing out of the walls, it's evaporating out of the walls if it's present as a liquid, if it's present as a gas, but it's diffusing into the air in the cellar. So now you've got some damp air in the cellar, what are you going to do with it? Because if there's no ventilation, it can't get away. And therefore, moisture builds up, the total moisture content of the air in the cellar goes up, the relative humidity goes up, and you end up with anything that's timber down there for a start will either get wet and start rotting, or it will get slightly wet, and if it's above about 12% moisture content, then good old little beetles start chomping at it and you start getting woodwork. So what is the solution? Well, actually it's ridiculously simple. You ventilate it. But just banging a hole in the wall of your cellar is not going to do anything because if you bang a hole in the wall, you'll get a bit of air coming in through the hole, but you don't then circulate air through the cellar. So in order for a cellar to work or a basement to work effectively and to be warm and dry, what you have to do is you have to move the volume of air in that space, out of the space. And if you look at building banks, it says the average house should have something like two and a half air changes an hour. Well, how many cellars and basements have two and a half air changes a day or a week? They don't. So they get wet. And then you come to us with problems. So a simple solution is to ventilate it. And ventilating it, even if you have a hole over there and a hole over there, you can't guarantee that you're going to get an airflow. What you're then dependent on is there's some wind blowing from this side and blowing the air through and out the other side, in which case, yes, you would have a nice dry cellar. But how often does that happen? It doesn't. So what we have to do is we have to establish a, an artificial system where we draw the air from the cellar and then we shove it out through the wall and we say, OK, we're going to bring in some warm, dry air. We're going to push the wet air out through the, the wall in the cellar and replace it with warm, dry air. Now, there are two ways of doing that. If you've got a nice, warm, dry house like this one, and we're going to show you here, uh, and we're going to show you a very wet cellar underneath. This is in the, the Bridge North Sandstone, but it's actually sitting on top of clay. Um, and the cellar sometimes actually has running water running through it. But the important thing here is that my floor and the beams in the floor are bone dry. And the, the, the walls of the cellar are actually starting to dry out. A um, very silly, silly thing happened years ago in that the cellar was painted with um, cellar paint, which is impermeable. So the walls actually find it quite hard to dry out. But we're, we're working on that and I'll show you. Um, so what do we do? We, we suck the air out and we replace it with air from in the building. And for that to happen, you've got to have vents or openings around the floors so that the nice warm, dry air in the house can circulate in and work its way through the cellar. If conversely, you want to work the other way around, you can actually have a ventilation system that will look for the driest source of air and it will bring dry air into the cellar and if it's coming from outside and the weather is very cold it will warm that air up so that the air coming into the cellar is, is, is at about 15 degrees centigrade um, and then the, 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 the moist damp air is pushed out through the other side and so you have an active system that is able to pick air up, push it through the cellar expel the damp air on the other side and that can work backwards and forwards depending on whether you're taking air from the house or the outside wherever. The bottom line is that you have to have a ventilation system that understands the air quality and when I talk about air quality I'm talking about the total amount of moisture that is dissolved into the air and that is measured in grams per cubic meter and dry air is about seven grams, which is about a teaspoonful of water in a cubic meter. Wet air starts to get very wet around about um, 12 grams. Uh, and if you've got more than 12 grams, it's pretty damp, wet, 
horrible air and at 12 grams and a high humidity you'll be rotting timber so you need to be very careful you've got to keep control over the amount of water dissolved in the air now where most ventilation systems go wrong is that they only measure relative humidity and relative humidity is well, it's a pretty useless measurement because the relative humidity can change from zero to a hundred percent at a given temperature um, and the amount of moisture dissolved in the air doesn't actually change. If you keep the relative humidity at say 75-80% uh, and, you <clears throat> and you maintain the total moisture content the temperature can change. It's a bit like a seesaw and I, I actually describe the whole relationship between these three variables as a seesaw and we take a um, total moisture content being a pivot of a seesaw and if you take a plank of wood and stick it on the pivot this is temperature this is relative humidity so for a given amount of moisture in the air if you take the relative humidity to a hundred percent the temperature drops and where it's a hundred percent this is a special case that 100 percent reading there that temperature is known as the dew point and at the dew point, water will condense. If you move it away from the dew point, the relative humidity drops and you're back to a situation where you won't get condensation forming within the walls. So what you have to realize is that measuring relative humidity is actually not a very clever thing because you can have a relative humidity of 100% at seven grams, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 20 grams, it doesn't matter. You still got the same relative humidity, but the amount of moisture dissolved in the air can go up and down. So what we do is we measure the total moisture content. And that is what we do with thermo hygrometers, which is these things that we use in our surveys. They cost about a thousand pounds. So you guys probably wouldn't buy one. You can buy them on Amazon. Um, they're little cheap things, about 25 quid and they'll give you quite a good reading. The one thing they won't do is calculate the absolute, the total amount of water dissolved in the air. You have to do that with software. Um, I'm in here at the moment in my office. It's 18.8 .8 degrees centigrade. It's 38.7% relative. So it's very, very dry in terms of the relative. And the total moisture content is 6.3 grams per cubic meter. So it's actually very dry air. It's almost too dry. Uh, so we're not going to get any damp in this room. Absolute given. So I don't want to confuse you too much, but what I'm trying to get across to people here at the moment, and you're going to have to watch another couple of videos to understand this relationship between temperature and relative humidity. The bottom line is if you've got a damp cellar or a damp basement or a damp subfloor to your house, don't panic because 99 times out of 100 what you need is better ventilation. You do not need expensive tanking. You can spend three or 400 quid and get good humidity controlled ventilation units that will over a period of time draw moisture from the cellar and make it perfectly livable. And we're going to go down in the cellar here now and we're going to show you uh, a little bit about how we've done it. It's very simple, not complicated, and we've got about three or four hundred quid's worth of equipment in the cellar and I will show you. Um, and before we go into the cellar, I'm just going to turn the camera onto the floor and we're going to show you the, uh, the nail holes. And this is one of the, the things that you will see if you're looking at the cellar. Um, the, these are the, the boards in my, my study. And you can see that there is a bit of staining. And this staining is because the cellar has at times been quite damp. So the nails are rusting. So this is a classic symptom 
of a cellar that has too much water in it and you can very often find this if we're doing a building survey you will actually find this in people's front rooms so you can have a little Victorian semi um, and if you've got timber floors if you have a look at the floors if you can see slightly rusty nail heads like this then you know that there's too much moisture underneath your floorboards and that will tell you that somebody has probably blocked up the ventilation through the cellar uh, or through the, the, the sub floor and you need to get better ventilation. Now in your Victorian semi part of the reason for that is that very often in the old days the floor was able to vent from front to back of the building. Then people filled in the room at the back which was usually the kitchen. So if you took the floor out and you filled it and then you put a cooker in there what you've done is you've blocked off the vent halfway through the house and the house can no longer vent so the the back the middle wall in the house usually gets quite wet or under the stairs because there's no through flow ventilation and it's that through flow ventilation of air that is super critical for keeping those those subfloor areas dry so whichever way you go if you've got a big space like we've got under here you need full control of the ventilation. If you've got a very small space and just a narrow hole, a couple of ventilation bricks are good, but you've got to make sure that there is actually through flow of air. So it's super critical. It's the one thing that we see in nearly every survey is not enough ventilation in houses. And I'm going to keep ham hammering the ventilation because it's the one thing that causes dampness in buildings. But this bit, we're going to show you now, we've got these new units. I'll take you in the cellar and you can have a look at the, um, the, the gadgetry that's in the cellar, which is very simple. Um, and hopefully you can then take steps to make your own cellar dry without having to spend a lot of money with damp wallies tanking the place. Okay, so let's go look at the cellar.